Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to tonight's podcast. Let's get it started early. We're on it to, to go. I'm going to introduce our two-star guest tonight. Uh, we're going to go in order of which I view you guys. So, Andrew, you're first. Please tell us who you are. Tell us your spiel. Give us the stuff. Give us that, that hype. <laughs> the hype. Yeah, so I'm Andrew Cook. Uh, I own a head business uh, support, and we are an HR consulting company that helps small businesses with fewer than 50 employees simplify their HR processes and so they can save time and money while attracting, retaining, and developing a great team. And I'm uh, a lifelong gamer, so I'm excited to be on here and see how I can mesh uh, my gaming experience with my, my business experience. Awesome. Can you tell us about your company a little bit? Uh, like, what to do? Oh, uh, yeah. So, uh, I like I said, I, I do HR consulting for small businesses. We help with uh, payroll recruiting, uh, help them set up processes and procedures for things like employee evaluations or developing uh, key performance indicators. Indicators. It's a lot of uh, compliance and and uh, really crunchy, nerdy HR stuff. Yeah. Hey, we are all about the crunchy, nerdy stuff of any category. <laughs> so, uh, anything else? Website, things you're promoting, stuff like that you want to talk about now? You can always come back to it later if you think of something later. So, no, no pressure. Um, nope. Website is just aheadsupport.com. And no no major promotions right now. I'm, I'm mostly neck deep and helping my clients wind up the end of their year and get uh, strategized and planned for 2024. And that's sort of what I'm doing internally as well. So hopefully early 2024, I'll have some some fun new things going on. But uh, for right now, just, you know, like brace for impact, keep my head down and get through the rest of this year. I feel that wholeheartedly. Sarah, <laughs> who are you? What do you do? Tell us, a, tell us your stuff. Okay, I'm a travel storyteller. I'm an author. Wait, wait, I'm an time international time public time speaker. Time sorry, oh. sorry to catch you off. What's your name? You can start with that. Oh, I'm Sarah. <laughs> Sarah. <laughs> Sarah Rocasano. I am the founder of Embolden Adventures, which is a travel inspiration content site. I'm a travel storyteller, international public speaker, and an author. Uh, and I wore my game shirt today. Since I'm a world traveler, I'm wearing Italy, Italia. This is my soccer jersey i suppose for the world cup so i'm here to represent and uh, i i too am a nerd i went to engineering school so i can definitely crunch some numbers for you guys too <laughs> much appreciated and in the, in the far corner is younger he doesn't need an introduction but if he wants to he can say something you're muted you're muted there buddy every time my bad my name is Andrew. i'm uh you know, co-operator of Epic Sages. Um, and so wonderful to have you all here as guests here today. Excited to hear what you guys have to bring to the table. All right. So I have bad inclement weather outside, so I'm probably going to have the camera off because it's not going to be well. As usual, it'd be like that. That's, that's what happens when you live in the middle of nowhere. So are you in so, Alaska? <laughs> I'm not. I'm actually in Arkansas, but I did meet Roger in Alaska. Yep. Yes. So uh, let's get into the topic. So tonight's topic is we miss you, right? Dealing with missing players. Um, and we're going to talk about this on several different levels of missing players. This can go from as funny as actually missing characters with roles, uh, not hitting the mark and things like that, and how to, to expand on making that more fun, right? As a DM, as a storyteller, to make things feel more engaging, right? Uh, to the, your player isn't there at the table, to your player has left the game completely. So those are kind of the three different things that I have as a basic setup, and we're going to just kind of snowball from there and talk about that kind of stuff. Uh, it should range from anywhere from like the social aspects, uh, the goods and the bads, all that fun stuff. So there'll be a lot to talk about tonight, so I hope you guys are uh, prepared for silly questions. First things first. Just to get a gauge on you guys, obviously Andrews and I have kind of talked about this already, but what did your guys' experience in the Nord realm? Both of you considered yourselves nerds. So uh, what, what's, your, what's your experience level with stuff? Yeah, so I guess we'll first. just keep going in order, Sarah. Um, I, I started uh, playing uh, first edition Red Book D&D &D way back in the 80s. 
and um pretty much found my you know like my nerd friends in uh, elementary school middle school so stayed with dungeons and dragons still play today i'm i'm lucky enough my son is 24 and uh he's been my my ro- most recent uh campaign companion i did a game with him one of my friends and one of my friend's sons so it was kind of neat to have like the the father son dynamic for those games uh play a lot of tabletop uh wargaming so um not really warhammer 40k i used to play that but have spun off into other rule sets um i saw that you guys were playing some uh, mecha gaming uh love the old robotech and uh, uh mech warrior games so yeah that's that's sort of my my whole thing and i i did this weird transition from um like paper and pencil gaming dungeons and dragons to video games for a very long time and then i almost went entirely back to paper and pencil gaming probably about mm, maybe six seven years ago that uh video games just sort of lost their polish and i felt like there was nothing tangible that gets created out of playing a video game it's not like you know you're I don't know. Maybe maybe your grand could stumble upon your save game at some point and and wonder it, you know, like what you did. But you know, like with with role playing games, there's character sheets to find. There's books. There's cards. There's I mean, there's so much stuff to discover with it. And uh, yeah, I just like I felt like I felt like I needed to leave behind some kind of a legacy. So I I paint miniatures. I sculpt. I build terrain i i like do everything so uh, this is this is awesome yeah so i'm gonna put a pin in that last statement you made because i think that's gonna be really relevant for what we're going to talk about today on more of an emotional level when you lose somebody um but we'll get to that after sarah gives us her input so is the question how am i a nerd as it pertains to gaming uh just as a nerd, or in, in general nerd in general what you i mean if you want to give us your gaming experience because i know you're a board gamer is something you enjoy doing but... Uh, okay, I'll, I'll give you kind of all of the above. Um, in terms of gaming, uh, I really loved to play Dr. Mario on the computer recently on a browser. It was some Romanian, like, you know, game, like vintage game website. Now it's gone, but I was like loving Dr. Mario. <laughs> I was like playing it till I could get to the highest levels. And my boyfriend and I one time sat in his truck and we were driving home and we listened to the Dr. Mario theme song on the radio. We we're just like, this is so great. <laughs> so, and then I took him, <laughs> took him to um, the post, Postmodern Jukebox. They're a band that tours around the country and they do a lot of cover songs in different genres of you know the musical era. And they did a whole like Mario theme uh, live in New Haven, Connecticut, and the guys tap dancing. And I'm like, this is amazing, all this <laughs> vintage Mario stuff. So, you know, that's, I think that that I could maybe qualify, get some points here if we talk about games and, and you know, <laughs> nerds. But um, specifically, you know, about nerds in general, well, nerds in general, I went, like I said, I went to engineering school, loved Calculus 4. You know, like didn't do so well in physics, but, um, you know, did well in chemistry. And, you know, we had a particle accelerator under the baseball field on, on in undergrad. So that was pretty cool. You know, I went to quarks and, you know, string theory and things that are esoteric and, you know, that pertains to quantum physics and theoretical physics and how it relates to like psychedelics. Like that's what my book is going to be about, about my experience in the rainforest, working with ayahuasca and, you know, seeing how it marries together with my engineering curriculums that I've learned, you know, when I was an undergrad. I also am a numbers nerd. I, I got my MBA in finance and I worked on Wall Street and it did a lot of deals. So <laughs> I'd spend hours on Excel and, you know, V lookup tables and <laughs> all these like advanced Excel things. I, even last night I was like parsing um, two different mail lists from Bold Adventures. I downloaded it from MailChimp and I was like comparing it and doing some, you know, can can cat calculations in the formula bar and i'm like i love this stuff so and even uh they have a world excel championship and i was like if i could be that good and compete in the world excel championship that that would be awesome don't tell me that i will have to tell my wife and she will be interested that's her favorite thing is excel stuff (laughs) 
<laughs> so to kind of refocus on our topic, going on to missing players. Um, so I'm going to give you guys the option here, and either one of you can speak. Uh, what category do you guys want to start in? You want to start in the social category, the uh, physical missing people category, the emotional category, or the uh, silly about the actual game mechanics category? Andrew, you Sarah, pick. do you have a... I, so I kind of feel like the actual physical missing person category. Sweet. Okay, that's easy to talk about. So uh, when you miss on a roll, right? Because you take your D20, mm -hmm. you roll it around, yada, yada. You can roll anywhere from 1 to 20. You add your multiple uh, things. So no, no calculus needed, just basic addition, subtraction. Um, but... Sometimes on those rolls, you obviously don't roll well. You know, not everything's a one, but not everything is a 20. So, you know, you get those things that are sevens and eights that don't necessarily hit most armor classes or skill checks or whatever you're doing for whatever system you're playing. And in that moment, DMs get a fantastic uh, ability to describe failure for your player. Right. We've talked about this in several other episodes, uh, but the descriptions that you use for your games on missing is just as exciting as when you're going and hitting things, right? The blood splatter and gore is exciting, right? But usually as a finish. In the meantime, um, missing can be just as exciting. A, a blow glancing off a shield or a piece of armor is just as impactful as you stabbing the goblin in the face. Um, and sometimes it's even more interesting, especially when, you know, the goblin stabs you and it doesn't go through your armor and their spear breaks or something crazy, right? So, uh, Annotating those kind of things when you are playing uh, would be probably on the more important end of what they are doing for description sides. Um, but on that, if you were to describe someone missing a swing with a weapon, we'll, uh, we'll start with Sarah this time. Sarah, if you were wielding a big giant axe and you missed, how would you describe that? Oof. <laughs> Oof, it's so heavy. <laughs> okay okay no no that's a that's a great descriptor right because you're using the onomatopoeia to, to to give the feeling of what happened fantastic any other same scenario uh uh you're you're worried now because now that person you're trying to kill is like oh i'm gonna get you and you're still you're kind of like in a vulnerable position so you're worried you're like ah shit i missed <laughs> now what <laughs> Okay, perfect. That's a that's a great descriptor for a character. When as a player, you can say, "Hey, I just missed a swing." My character is freaking out because he's out of position and whatnot. Andrew, different scenario. Uh, I'm going to hand you an imaginary bow, and your character just whiffs it. How, how do they whiff it? What, how would you describe that on your end? Oh yeah, so this is this is one of those like you pull the bow back, but instead of letting go of the string side, you let go of the the bow side, and it just comes back and like smacks you in the face and just like stuns your character momentarily and now you have to you know go through the process of figuring out can you pick up your weapon can you like regain your composure like this is not just a you you didn't shoot straight this is now like one of these you've got a situation on your hands and i always love this idea of you know, like you're this mighty character and you're you're fighting the, the goblins or whatever and you have this moment, right, where you just like, you clearly lose focus and you just, you know, hit yourself in the face with a bow and everybody on the other side of the battlefield just sort of like stops and is like, did that just happen? You know, it's like that person who's walking down the street and they totally like stumble over a curb or something and they have like that wild like arms flailing and they catch themselves and they look around for a second like... Did anybody see me? And, and like, clearly everybody saw them. Everybody's just standing there like, oh, I thought that guy was going to eat pavement. It's like that moment, but with goblins staring at your your mighty hero who, who can't hold on to his bow. So you bring up a, an interesting description. Is describing how the enemies react to a, uh, a miss, right? Uh, getting a surge of confidence, seeing a player character miss a swing, right? And having them act more aggressively because you were goofing up. The bow hits you in the face and suddenly... All the attention is on you because you don't have a bow in your hand uh, is a is a wonderful addition and makes sense in story. Right. If you can describe all the eyes suddenly turning to a character that has failed terribly uh, and have that be the reason why everyone's ganging up on them. That's a great way to, to add flavor and flair to you. A missed hit younger jumping over to you. You got anything fun to add to this idea? You want me to give you a weapon or you want to come up with one yourself? 
Oh, I got a great idea. So oh. one of my favorite things is when the uh, players are extremely close to hitting the armor class of the enemy, but they are just like one or two short, especially if they're fighting something as basic as a bandit captain. And, you know, they're one below the AC or they're right at the AC. And it's like, oh, the enemy uses their reaction to parry and the blade gleams off the edge of their of their sword. And it's just like, the players are like, I was so close. Or you're barely able to, you're right below the AC of the dragon. And the guy's like, I rolled a 17 to hit. And it's like, the armor hits, you know, it, the scales of the dragon. But they, they seemingly do nothing. And just like the look of horror on the character's faces, they're like, that wasn't even a bad hit. Exactly. I, I love the... um sort of like the the breaking the the fourth wall so sometimes you know, if i'm i'm playing and i've got a character he's like oh that was an awesome role and i'm like you you feel like you missed by like if there was a dice somewhere you feel like you missed by like just one or two points you know so they're they're sort of trying to figure out like what is the armor class what does hit this this opponent like just give them the like you feel like you're pretty close. You feel like that really should have landed, but it didn't quite, you know, like, so they, they have that, that hint. I know. I always like making the players squirm when they, when they miss by one and just be like, you weren't even close. They just, just dodged out the way. No problem. <laughs> just, you gotta try harder than that. <laughs> uh, but, okay. So that's, that's the, uh, the straight up, missing missing a player with a hit right just adding those descriptions those narratives those onomatopoeias and you can do that as both a player and a dm right uh, depending on the system sometimes it's way more uh, dungeon master or game master heavy side of descriptions other times it's the players telling you how they do things even when they fail um and as a game master it is very important to include your players in those misses as well right because if they can describe their their character's failures they won't be afraid to do so so often, right? You'll find that people will fudge dice less and things like that at your table when they know that, like, failing isn't the end of the world, right? Uh, when they get to have some fun with it, when there's some kind of narrative piece to that miss, it doesn't have to be every single one, so you're not spending 40 minutes in a single combat as everyone narrates every swoosh and swirl that they have, but giving one or two opportunities to your players to describe how they mess up or describe how they succeed is super important. Now... Moving on to the next category, missing a player uh, because of scheduling, which is the bane of all Game Master's existence, is people not showing up when it is 7 o'clock uh, because their car broke down, or the baby got sick, okay. or whatever else is the issue for the week, right? Um, and so I'm going to kind of jump to you guys on your personal levels. When you guys are dealing with clients, I'm going to start, uh, we're going to start with Andrew again. When you're dealing with your clients, how do you deal with those misscheduling stuff? What is the, the best way for you personally in your business to recover from that? Yeah, so I, I think that, you know, like from my business aspect, because one part of my business is managing people, that human resource, um, you know, that, that's, that has one set of consequences, right? Like if you have an employee who just doesn't show up, then you have to have you have to have plans in place to make sure that whatever it is that they were responsible for gets handled for that day. Um, if you're talking very like personal, like you and I were going to have a meeting and and you had to back out or you just missed it for whatever reason, I feel very um, uh, compassionate about that kind of stuff. You know, I, I've got a a son for many years. He was. Uh, you know, he wasn't an excuse, but he was a reason why things didn't always run smoothly in my my life. Um, you know, I have a spouse. Sometimes, you know, she had the car and got home later than she thought she was going to. And, you know, so I, I feel like that's just a great place to give some grace to people. Uh, I don't I don't like it on a personal level. If I have the ability, I don't tend to hold those things over people's heads. Uh, but also, you know, like in in some reality, the show must go on, right? So if you have a business and your employee doesn't show up to unlock the store, like there, there are consequences that happen in those those equations. It doesn't have to be personal, but you know, like just from a, a 
a purely like this is the expectation you failed to meet it um and i i do feel like that you know holds true for myself right like if i'm if i'm showing up in a meeting and there there can be some grace about hey i ran a little late i got off one meeting with a client late you know i i would i like working with people that are just realistic about the fact that uh, the world is complex and uh, doesn't run smoothly all the time uh, but at the same time you know if i if i've set forth a guarantee uh, as a business person that i would get this project done at this time then um yeah i mean i i, I recognize there're just going to be consequences whatever those might be uh for my my absence nice so i'm going to i'm going to hone in on something before we jump over to Sarah really quick so you said our our favorite key line uh in on our side of things for dealing with people and that's setting expectations right you specifically said uh, that they failed the expectations, right? So a big part of when you're dealing with scheduling, right, is it setting the expectation of what you will do when they are not there. Now, I'm going to get into that in a second and ramble in a minute, but just pin that for thoughts for, for, for later. Sarah, jump it over to you. Yeah. How do you personally deal with people that don't show up on time or aren't there personally in your business? Uh, you know, when they show, when you've set up these amazing adventures and then they don't book the flight or they don't show up where they're supposed to be at the right time and stuff gets all jumbled. How do you deal with that? Oh, geez. Well, those are big problems, right? If we miss a flight, <laughs> we miss a train, <laughs> we miss, you know, a whole host of things. Um, you know, I'm a planner and I love to be organized. And so, you know, hurting the kittens, as I like to call it, especially when you're with lots of people <laughs> on, on an adventure, <laughs> <laughs> there's some people that you know we said we needed to be downstairs at such and such you know hour in the morning and they're still like oh wait a minute i gotta put my stuff in the suitcase still it's like guys the bus is outside <laughs> so there's a lot of uh, making sure that people are aligned <laughs> like do we know when the roll call is and are we packed and so there's a lot of communication that leads up to leading up to the night before you know here's your itinerary here's all these you know kind of plan b's god forbid so I'm one to be on top of details, being organized, you know, double and triple checking things, you know, alternative plans if, if things, you know, don't go as as planned, which typically can happen. Uh, but that just comes with the territory and all my sort of jobs I've been in, you know, over the years and running deals and whatnot. You know, things can go wrong. Things will go wrong. But it's all about my favorite quote, if, you know, by Abraham Lincoln. If I had eight hours to chop down a tree back to the ax, I'd spend six hours sharpening my ax. So that's the quote that I like to think about because it's all about preparation. If you put in the plans, if you think about things, you double think about things, what could go wrong? How do we risk mitigate? You know, when it's go time, it should just be operational at that point. Nice. Okay. So you, you both brought up fantastic points. Sarah, I'm going to key on, on your, it takes communication, right? So with your players, right, knowing how they're doing and what they're doing, sometimes with, you know, if you're doing the business style stuff like that, you don't necessarily know the personal goings-ons of your clients, right? Because as much as I want to be your friend, you don't necessarily tell me that uh, uh, Rocco the dog is sick uh, and, you know, might have to go to the hospital because I'm probably the last person that you're concerned with when your dog's sick, right? Uh, but having a, excuse me, I'm going to kill my headset really quick and turn it back on because it's being all fuzzy. Um, but having the, uh, wherewithal to message your people ahead of time, be like, Hey, how's it going? What's going on? That kind of stuff. Uh, in our groups, when we have a long-term group that we're going to have more than a couple sessions, we set up a special chat that's just for them. So we can be like, Hey, who's showing up this week? Do we have extra people coming? Is there, you know, what's going on? The schedule's still good. All that fun stuff. Right. And that mitigates stuff, but life happens. Right. And uh, as Andrew was saying, you know, you give people grace when you can, right? The life is, IRL is number one for us. And we put that forward with all of our people and, you know, stuff is going to happen. It's in our policies, all that fun stuff, right? Um, but when the kittens aren't herded and you have to give the people grace, um, <laughs> being able to have that plan B, what do you do with a, without your players there is probably the most key component to running a campaign. Now, sometimes the easy answer is call it quits because, you know, you're missing three of your four people and it's just you and some guy, which you can run, but it's generally not as fun, right? Um, 
like for us, we require three people, right? That can include a DM if they're playing a character along with the people, but you need three players, right? To have a good story is our general wherewithal. Um, so when those players don't show up or you're only missing one of your four people or something like that, right? There's still enough people that can continue on and do things. Uh, having a reason for why they're not there is a wonderful excuse. So going back to fun, silly questions, um, starting with Younger this time, because he's over there in the corner. Younger, what is your go-to uh, way to ex machina a character from a story? So they're still tagging along or something has happened to them where they'll still gain experience and do things uh, when they are not there in person. Well, you see, um, there there is people... Uh, in the game, much like people in real life can have similar things happen. For the most part, I don't see any reason why a character couldn't potentially um, be sick when a player is sick. Um, you know, they're they're recovering from some terrible disease. You know, uh, they they had to they had to go to the special chapel. They had to uh, go through a a huge ritual in order to. Uh, to cure or overcome this thing, you know, or they had to go on a small side quest and, you know, talk to a hag about their third eyeball that popped up on their toes. I don't, I don't know. Kind of, kind of on that note, I also just like to, uh, if you want to have a realism in your game, if you're playing a game that requires realism, like diarrhea dysentery is something that is liberal, but will basically take you out of the campaign for however long you need it to. So if your your character is just <laughs> having, have, having having the bubbly guts, that's okay too. If you need a uh, you know realistic idea, most characters are humanoid and they're gonna have those issues, right? So they kind of tag on younger stuff. Um, jump again to Sarah. Yeah, you can also um tie tie it into like bad stories, you know, like oh maybe the the player can't make it, so oh they're nearby one of their home villages or whatever, so they went to go gr visit their mima, you know. And then you can have a side a side conversation with that player uh, off site, you know, as to like expanding upon their individual backstory or something within that capacity as well that they can then bring back to the table with them whenever the players are like, oh, what were you doing? Fantastic. Good idea. So, Sarah, jumping jumping over to you. In these imaginary scenarios, what would be something fun or exciting that you would use to replace a character who is not there and make an excuse for their <laughs> I mean, absence? I guess I'll try to uh, try to use an example that I know because I don't really game like you guys in this this sort of scenario. So I'm trying to follow I along gotcha. here. Yeah. Um, uh, but what I am thinking about is Leroy Jenkins. <laughs> Do you know that? Of course. Of course. Yeah. Yes. But, you know, they're all like, you know, Planning, planning, Leroy's, you know, nowhere to be found, nowhere to be found. <laughs> and then all of a sudden he comes storms in through. But, you know, he got clearly, you know, destroyed their plan. You know, th this feels similar to what this scenario, you know, sounds like. But it's, you know, you could make a mountain out of a molehill, right? Like, in this case, it went viral. It went on Joe Rogan. You know, they played it you know, <laughs> as a clip this past year. Um, people know it. You know, millions of people know Leroy. So you can leverage anything to your advantage. And I think that's how, you know, you could take, you know, crappy situations <laughs> that aren't going to plan and, and still have hope that things will work themselves out the way they do. So I think I'm going to go with that answer. Leroy Jenkins. <laughs> Leroy Jenkins' excuse. So in, in that scenario, would you say like the character ran off on his own to go cause havoc would be an appropriate excuse? Leaving I guess so. He wasn't of... paying attention and then he just took matters into his own hands. I like that. I and like you're that. like, damn it, Leroy. <laughs> uh, I'm going to use that later. Oh, there goes Younger. He'll be back. <laughs> Andrew, jumping over to you. Uh, do you have any go-to scenarios where uh, people like show up or don't show up uh, for your sessions? Um. Yes, but so I actually think that Sarah's idea with Leroy Jenkins is pretty brilliant. So typically, you know, like we talk about why somebody got left behind, right? Like you're sick, you kind of get left behind. You're you go visit family, you get left behind. Leroy Jenkins is a like, I got up at the crack of dawn, packed my stuff, and ran ahead type of dude, right? Like he's not waiting for anybody. He went. Like he jumped ahead, so now you have like a great excuse for why everybody else catches up to your, you know, like your your Leroy character in this example. 
you can just insert him into a scene, you know, somewhere down the road, he's got like four dead orcs around his feet. And it's like, Oh, I'm so glad everybody caught up to me. You know, like now the party's all back together. So I think that's actually, that was actually really good. Um, for me, I don't know why. I just like I I have this fascination with uh, demonic pacts. So for me, it is uh, it's always like you your character has to sort of sneak off in shame to like pay homage to this demonic uh, force that controls them secretly behind the scenes, which has actually always worked out pretty brilliantly because then I give my character, you know, like that, that player, the option to basically say like, what, you know, what dark deeds were you up to? You don't have to tell anybody. You can tell me as the DM. And then I'm going to feed that back into the, you know, like the game somewhere down the line, like you're going to be in a tavern and suddenly like that character is going to find a cultist in the corner. Who's kind of like, Jim, what are you doing, man? And everybody else is like, you know this cultist guy so i i like that idea of maybe not really being super specific about it but just saying like you were gone nobody really knows what you were up to so you need to tell me a piece of that story we're gonna weave this in somehow nice i think i think that uh foster character storytelling as well i mean it gives them a what did you do during your last session i do something similar uh that i have lovingly called land sharking my players because uh, in one of our campaigns, they were cursed by a deity to be summoned to his realm to go fight uh, creatures for him, right? He was hunting them in the forest. So whenever he needed them, when they didn't show up to a session, their character would be walking along and a land shark would just eat them. And they would be out of the session until they came back. And they would be born again in trees, which was really awkward when we were on the plains and there was like no trees anywhere. So they'd be like coming out of roots out of the ground like zombies. No, no, it's just a character. It's fine. Um <laughs> But the uh, the land sharks is a affectionate term I have for any time you just snatch a character out of the campaign and put them somewhere else while they're doing some off brand deed, right? Um, but all that being said, that's that's those are all great ways to deal with the scheduling. Hey, I couldn't show up. We're not there anymore. That kind of thing, right? So let's go to the I'm gone. There's there there. I had to step away. Um, I'm not there anymore. And we'll do temporary and long term. So temporary, I'm gone. Um, being like a character has died. You had a bad session and started off killing the monk. The monk was just standing there and got swacked by the land shark that wasn't trying to teleport him to a magical realm. Um, so what do you, what do you guys feel like you would do to kind of give that other player, uh, a chance to continue with the group while not being there presently, right? Instead of having to wait an hour for them to build a new character or whatever. What's a, what's a way you think that they could affect the games while being there? Ooh, so uh, just to clarify, you're saying the person is present, but the character is gone Correct. now. Yes. So now they're, they're basically observing the, the game. Um, man. So, I, I mean, I, I feel like I've always been pretty lucky that, that, the people that I play with love absurdity, right? So like we've had sandwiches that, you know, that heal, but also have like some percentage chance to get addicted. And then you get like one player who's addicted. So you have like this kind of crack fiend guy that needs to eat these sandwiches and the other players have sandwiches. So he's always trying to barter for the sandwiches. So I, I love this idea of like these stories just sort of like grow on their own. Um, I feel like I've never really had a problem with the the players um, sitting around and just laughing, being a part of the action, you know, like, because it's always like, oh, and your character could do this. And, oh, oh, you know, like, it'd be awesome if you, you did this thing. And so it's always like half trying to get the other characters to do, also do something stupid to get them killed. And, like, maybe some, you know, like, do something that's wildly heroic and just and weird, right? So I think that, I've I've always had people that just are um, into that storytelling and and very much uh, part of it. But I also kind of like as as I'm talking like this idea that they you know like they're sort of like a a Star Wars Jedi ghost right like where they can 
where they can sort of like, we'll give them an opportunity every once in a while to show up in a uh, non-corporeal form and uh, give them, you know, you have three seconds to say something and like put them on a timer and just cut them off. Like that's, that was all you got to say, right? Put them on the spot and make it hard for them to interact, but still give them, you know, now they're thinking like, well, next time I'm going to have three seconds. What am I going to say? Right. So they're always sort of like, I only have this much time to talk to everybody else in, in game world. So like maybe just creating weird scenarios like that, where they now have a different set of rules. They can still interact. Their character's still sort of around. Uh, maybe they possess a, a nearby weapon, whatever. Right. Like, but now they can sort of interact a little bit. Nice. Okay. Those are all fantastic options. Uh, just as a heads up, you are echoing real bad. I am? Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Oh. So, Sarah, on yeah. to you on the social aspect of things a little bit. Um, how would you deal with the person? You're you're good at the whole herding cats, so how would you herd the cats when their thing that they're playing with is dead? So I, I don't I'm not really 100 percent clear as to what's going on. I'm assuming the person so I'm, I'm thinking about it in Mario. So like he ran out of lives, he jumped in the little like, you know, pit. And he mm -hmm. went, do, 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 do. but yet people are still playing like collectively. Yeah. So let's, um, say, let's say you're playing with your, yeah. your your little brother, your cousin, whatever, and you have 10, 10 lives because you know what you're playing and they have three and they've jumped off the cliff. And they times. die. Yep. They're dead. Okay. So can't they just call me on a conference call and then like watch the game as it's happening and give me pointers from their perspective? So it'll help me. Like, if we're collaborating now, like, dude, like, I could see this in this part of the world. Why can't you, you know, it's like two heads now are collaborating to get this to, to win the game. Is That's kind of what I'm like. Oh, dude, I could use you. I could use your eyes, even though your character is not is dead. Can't you just call me on the phone or something and tell me what's going? Give me some more tips. <laughs> help me. Help me win. Okay, so you would, <laughs> is that you would... things work, or are we mad that this person's dead? It's like, oh no, you you're letting our team down. I mean, I would think I could still leverage his uh, expertise somehow. Right? No, no, no. That's that's <laughs> that's perfectly fine. I mean, it sounds like you would be a fan of having some kind of mechanic built in to where like they would grant you advantage, or you remembered a story that they told you once that gives you their proficiency bonus or something silly mechanically wise yeah. to improve what's Tell me going what on. you know how we can win yeah even though you can't physically play now because whatever happened to you on your screen you could still see what's going on i'm presuming so can't you just like tell me where the treasure's buried <laughs> you know <laughs> give me some hints <laughs> interesting okay so uh <laughs> there are a couple of systems that kind of do something similar to this um I'm, right now i'm specifically thinking of blades in the dark uh, where a lot of your abilities and things that you get, you get to have flashbacks. So having a style of game like that, where you get to have a flashback, where they get to have that interaction would be a really easy way for them to convey information, give you some kind of assistance without them necessarily being a force ghost and allow the player to still sit there and have that conversation in real time. If that is more of a setting that you want, I think the force ghost things are great. Cause again, the on the spot improv is, is where I shine. Uh, so as often as I can do it, uh, I do it as often as I can. Um, was that repetitive enough? It sounded like it was. <laughs> um, so, uh, younger, you got anything to add to this, this, uh, missing, missing people thought? Oh yeah. Well, I mean, I'm going to start to the point right before they die. Um, at least in D and D they make death saves. And I think that's a perfect point an insertion point to make it so that there is a, uh, like a theatrical background aspect of like the, your life flashing before your eyes. And you're thinking of like your loved ones or like what you did, what you wanted to do or what you didn't do. So on and so forth, you know, the good side and the bad side, uh, depending on what your save was so on and so forth. And then, um, after the character dies, um, it, I would say like, for instance, if you, if there was like an ancestral, barbarian or something maybe one of the like spirits that is now there is uh your 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 teammate who just completely finished dying and you might l allow them to continue the fight for that last bit of combat or um what i like to do at least in an in-person thing is um like why not have that player especially if it's early in the session uh run some mobs for you while you're fighting you're like 
hey, run the mobs. You're going to kill all your friends now. Um, or if they are killed by something like a white, uh, one of the things that happens is you become an undead. So um, have them <laughs> literally be their character trying to kill the other characters. Um, things like that. There, there's tons of ways that you can uh, add some additional flair or additional context to it. Or um, another thing is, oh, now your party is lacking a healer because your cleric just died. Okay, well, you guys go back to the local adventuring guild after you're like, oh, man, I wasn't able to pay for the revivify or whatever in that amount of time. So now you go and you send them a temporary NPC that they can play for the rest of the session to complete said quest. Interesting, interesting. So I think all three of those points are are valid, right? Having pre-made characters that are just temp characters until they finish their own when they have free time, great. Having them play an undead version or a, you know, other your other enemies for you to give challenge to the players. A, take some of the work out of your hands uh, as a GM or DM and allows them to continue playing. Um, the only caution I'd have to add to that one is it sparks a little bit of PvP. And uh, with a lot of the TTRPGs that we play, PvP is fun in concept, but not great in reality. Um, because people get butt hurt when you stab their character when allegedly you were friends beforehand. Um, so if you're going to do it, you have to do it well and be careful with uh, how you run through it. We uh, we had an episode on that one uh, a while ago. Was playing uh, PvP stuff, but that's neither here nor there. Let's talk about the missing someone physically. Like they have left the game. Like if they're tragic accident IRL and they're no longer with us, or if they are just like they had to move can't be there anymore they that they were uh whoever to the group right character wise not super important but you're missing that specific person um let's say this specific person could something andrew pointed out about earlier is he paints miniatures and stuff well what if this was the guy that painted everyone's models right people buy him models he paint them for it so you guys could play together because that was his thing he enjoyed doing that for you whatever right so how how do you guys deal with that lack of person that you have grown attached to Right on on a personal level, how do you deal with the loss of someone, even if it isn't a permanent real loss? Right, let's we'll stick with the lighter topic of them moving and not dying. Um, how do you how do you deal with that separation, like on a on a personal level? Starting with Andrew. Yeah, so I I actually have experienced this very thing. My my friend's son went to college, and and um. You know, it didn't feel right to continue the the campaign, something that we had been doing for months and months and months. And then you lose, you know, like one of essentially three main characters. Right. And it just it didn't feel right to continue on. So we just decided we weren't going to continue with that campaign anymore without that character around. And, uh, you know, like some of us went off and found different games to to participate in. I, I think that's really difficult when you have, um, you know, like these really small, tight-knit gaming groups to lose somebody like that, like physically, um, they're just out of the picture. Uh, you can transition to other games uh, so that it's maybe you're not playing the same game, uh, but just it, it, it always feels weird to carry on with the same game the same story you know all of the background all the development all the things that they brought to the table and now you've lost all of that right like that that is is really challenging uh and unfortunately i think that's really how most of my campaigns end i don't know that i've ever like just really like run through because i think those things uh my hope is always like oh these are going to be grand adventures and they're going to last for you know years and years or whatever Right. And you're going to see characters go from level one to whatever. And they're going to be like these mighty heroes and lords of the city. And and life always gets in the way somewhere along the line. Right. So I am super curious to hear what you guys say about that, because that really, like I said, that has been a challenge that I have faced. And I don't know that I've found a great answer uh, outside of just sort of being like, I guess that game's over. Oh, do we have answers for you? And I will do that when I speak. But for Sarah, so again, more on a personal level, for if it doesn't necessarily have to be in a gaming setting, right? 
So how do you personally handle dealing with the loss of a person? And not, again, a lighter hearted, not they didn't die. They're just out of your life. Right. For yeah. positive reasons. I, I mean, as I'm thinking about this, that, you know, thank you, Andrew, because now I can understand how how personal this could be, because immediately I was just like, find another player. <laughs> you know, but um, I get why that's a little harder. But uh, I would equate it personally, um, just like a job, you know, like when you have a coworker or someone who reports to you, uh, you know, they're going to give you a heads up, maybe a two weeks notice or something that they're moving forward with something else. And, you know, the only constant in life is change. So eventually this will happen. Uh, so I would think that there's an opportunity to recruit somebody and have that person, if they are so willing to be involved in that recruiting process. So you would, you know, write up a, in the case of a job, write up your job description. These are the qualifications. These are, you know, your experience. We need X amount of years and gaming, you know, specific games, you know how to play well, you know, this and that and the other. And then, you know, Put it out to the gaming community, put the put the job posting out and say, hey, anyone want to qualify who qualifies, want to interview for this role for our team. And then the team would figure out, you know, once they interview the candidates and figure out the right questions to ask to, d to decide if this person's an easy shoe in potentially. And maybe even engage that other person who's leaving and say, hey, would you like a role in, in finding your replacement for us? You know, since you have specific, unique you know, experiences and understanding of this game, you know, help us scope out the right player to insert in. So I would approach it that way. But I would, I was also thinking about this when you first posed this question, because I was like, wait a minute, does chat GPT play games? Like can a chat GPT AI <laughs> just it'd be inserted in and, 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 and be on your team? Just let the chat GPT guy in, let him, let the robot do it. <laughs> So the the simple answer to your question is yes, they can totally play characters as long as you do the right, right. prompts. Put, and put, yep, but bring stuff. the robot in. <laughs> uh, the only downside to ChatGPT and other AI stuff is the time it takes for things to pop up. And not necessarily on the robot side of things, but you as a GM or one of your players that are filling in that role to kind of simulate the person having their reactions and whatnot have to type everything down. Uh, even if you're like speaking through it, you still have to take 30 seconds to be like, your character is doing this. So here's the prompt. Give us an answer. Um, so you could do that. Totally. I, I meant that GPT like version 10, you know, with the actual computer doesn't even have to type. It just knows. <laughs> one of these days. One of these days knowing. We'll, and you don't we'll... even need to type prompts. It just knows. <laughs> Watches <laughs> and does. <laughs> Alexa so, has a D&D &D, uh, re related uh, <laughs> action. There you go. Or the IBM, the, the supercomputer, the IBM. What is it? Like, what's his name? Charlie? <laughs> Look, Oscar? I'm, I'm the one playing Jeopardy. <laughs> I'm sure they, uh, they have more important things to do than play other people's D&D &D stories. But in the near future, when we all have our personal side never case, know. It's a business opportunity. Bring hey. it in. You know, you could charge money for this. <laughs> I like it. I just got to figure out how to code better. Um, <laughs> so, but I, that brings up some really good points. So as a, as a business that does this, right, when we're playing our games and whatnot, the process you described is very much how we do our display games. When we lose a character in display games, that's how we treat getting a new person. They get interviewed, we have discussions, we kind of fill them in on the story and go from there and, you know, insert their character as needed, right? On personal level games, and uh, Younger over there can attest to this, uh, is we will play until we cannot, right? Uh, again, getting down to those two, three people, because in an adventuring story, sometimes people don't live, right? And as not fun as it is to lose your mage that's been with you from day one the entire time, pushing through that story builds a way more complex web for the characters that remained to have their... Uh, we call them safe traumas, right? Because you can experience loss and heartache and all those things in a safe environment. You are not physically uh, getting beat down by emotional rain of your best friend in game dying, right? But as a human, because our brains think whatever we're thinking is real, uh, we get to experience those traumas safely, right? You're, you're not actually going to go through it. At the end of the day, you can disassociate and be like, all right, cool, I'm no longer Dragon Slayer McGee. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm me. I, I'm okay. Uh, the mage was not a real person. I don't have to actually cry over him. Uh, kind of stuff, right? So having your characters push forward story-wise until you can find someone to fill that gap again, because sometimes you're in a place where it's like, I can't find people. Not everyone does online games. Some people just do in-person stuff. 
uh, and you're limited on how many people are in the area. You can always put out Craigslist or, you know, put put applications out there in IRL stuff to find people, game shops. Those are great places to find things. Um, we use quite a few discords uh, for our Lancer game when we lost uh, our first set of players that initially signed up. Uh, we went straight to the Lancer stuff or the Lancer discord. And we're like, hey, this is the game we're playing. We're so many levels in. Uh, who wants to join up? And we had like 10 people do requests and we picked two or three of them and, you know, kind of went through a couple of them because the unfortunate part of playing with people online is you don't know them in person and you can't hound them. You like show up, please. Um, <laughs> instead you just have to trust that they're going to be there. And, uh, the ones that do are generally great role players and have lots of fun. And the ones that don't are, you know, the ones that don't, you know, it happens. You just repeat the process until you find the right thing. And you can do that with a physical game without having a quote unquote interview, right? Uh, most people, even when they have zero experience, if you say, hey, come play this fun game with me for an afternoon, I'm bringing pizza and beer or whatever your snack of choice is, right? Most people are going to go, ah, you know, worst comes to worst, I get pizza and beer, I get to hang out, and I, you know, D&D &D and all the other TTRPGs out there are an addiction. You get a little taste, you just keep going, as long as you like it, right? Because there are some people that are going to play and be like, that was not fun, I didn't understand what's going on, this is, this is dumb. And they'll move on, right? And you'll know you wouldn't want them at the table anyway, right? Or they they do enjoy it, but they are a very different player than your group needs or can deal with. Again, having a fun session with them one time as a one-shot character while they're moving along, totally acceptable, and you can kind of fill the gaps as needed there. Um, Before I continue rambling, Younger, you got anything to add to this? Um, So everybody went into a lot of the heartfelt, wonderful things uh, about how to go about dealing with it. Um, whenever you, what, at least from what I've, I've experienced, you know, like there's, there's good breaks and there's bad breaks, but nobody really talks about um, if you, your character, if the player leaves, your character doesn't necessarily need to die. I mean, that's Roger's favorite thing to do is kill everybody's character when they leave. Um, Not always, but, like, but why a can't lot they of the just time. go back to hunky-dory, you know, little town, and then they be an NPC who lives out their lives or whatever, um, and then can be interacted with in the future if the characters go to that location. Like, you can always, um, as long as you leave on good terms and they didn't, like, suddenly, like, um, well, in real life, die or uh, like just like leave on like super bad terms and you're not talking anymore. Like you can communicate with that uh, player to say like, hey, where do you want your character's story to end up? You know, in a quote unquote realistic in a fantasy setting uh, situation, you know, like where, where do you want them to go? What do you want their, their goals to continue to be? So on and so forth. And you can uh, further progress the story that way. You know, maybe they're... Uh, they have a change, a change of ideals or a change of uh, mission, and now oh, the the paladin is going on a divine quest, and it sends him away off the uh, off the beaten path of the rest of the chosen heroes, you know, and he has to go find his own way, you know, in service to his uh, the in service to the crown, the king, uh, or or whatever. Right. So, I mean, that's a that's a that's a great point. They can run off and do their their own thing, um, and that kind of jumps into generational gameplay. Oh, wait, oop, yes. Can I ask a quick question? Of course. Okay, before we continue on, um, I have a question regarding this scenario. So, if we're practicing and we have a really good team, um, do you guys like compete in like? various levels to get to like an olympic level like you know how in south korea they have these solo gamers that like play in tournaments in like these massive stadiums is so, that what your guys aim can be potentially is to make so, sure you got the right team to like also win the prize globally so there's no real winning in DD &D specifically they do have adventures league which is like a shared universal story that uses like the canon stuff from wizards of the coast uh, that you can do big tournaments and things and like winning would be having your character engraved in a Wizards of the Coast book. You know what I mean? So sometimes with the Adventures League, your character that was super badass at a, we'll call it a tournament, but that's not really what they are generally. Um, 
you know, was the scored the most points story wise or was the most known name or something like that. Right. Gets a spot in the book. That would be winning. Right. Because they get to be part of the story, because at the end of the day, it's all about building story. Yes, there's combat. Yes, there's fighting. Yes, there's all that fun stuff. But it is way more focused on the the stories that you are telling as a group together and the fundamental stuff that you are building. There is no necessarily uh -huh. end game, right? There isn't a big boss to beat and then the story is over. Now, is there a big boss to beat and then the story is over? Sure. But in most scenarios, once you beat the big boss, you still have to live your life, right? There is story oh. after the fight. There is the, the epilogues of all your characters. Now, as storytellers, the big fight might be the last climactic thing, but then you get to hear all those, I went home to mom and dad, or I became the lord of the city, or all that fun stuff. And this jumps nicely into the general ga generational gaming that I've talked about, right? So Jake is a generational world. We've played, what is it now, younger, six generations on Jake uh, of various times, um, some at the same at time. At a minimum. At, yeah, at least six generations. Um, where they've interacted with each other and have a strong history from the back. And I will still message players from our original campaigns and be like, hey, if in this situation, if I introduce your character to this new group, what how would they interact? Or I need a story from your character that is from, you know, 10 years ago that they need a legend to spin off of. What is something your character would do in this situation, right? So they are not physically there playing with me, right? To tell me what their character is doing, but having that communication still with them to allow their character to progress and grow in the story. Because like Yanger said, sometimes you just step away. You're done. You don't need to be an adventure fighting goblins when you own a small nation's worth of gold and you can pay people to do what you want. You know what I mean? Not everyone wants to fight forever. Some people have goals of setting up shop and being happy somewhere or as happy as an adventure sitting on a throne can be. Um, so, with all that being said, uh, losing those players doesn't necessarily mean, mean the end of your dynamic, right? Um, you can continue on with that well after you're done rolling at the table. When go back to communications and setting expectations. If you talk to your players, cool. If you tell them ahead of time, if your character lives through this story, I'm going to talk to you about them in the future, right? Because I'm going to play on this world and the stuff that we build is going to be meaning to other people. You will make people hyper invest into these stories, right? They will want to be there as much as they can because they know they are affecting a narrative of something bigger, whether they realize that's what they're doing or not is a different story. But for all the years that I've played doing stories that way, uh, makes people invest in their stuff way more. Those joke characters that people make at level one that make it to level 20 that are ridiculous heroes, uh, are something that they will talk about forever. Their entire life, they will talk about uh, Boblin the Goblin, the rogue thief stabby boy, forever, right? That that silly character that is in their back of the mind is going to be part of their person as a whole, right? So uh, if we go to winning, if you can get a character to invest, in, or a person to invest into their character that hard, you've won. That's that's how you win D&D, &D, right? Um, <laughs> but... So this is amazing. Oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. No, this is amazing because, you know, right under my nose, you know, I'm a ch product of the 80s, so we played Atari and early stage Nintendo. So there was always just like a chronological order to win the game. That's it, right? It's the single player win the game. And now, you know, I've obviously these games have evolved under my nose. I haven't played them. But uh, now it seems like you're, they're virtual. Like this is a virtual world. You're creating a virtual um, soap opera. You know, this is like just virtual land and, 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 and there's story behind it. So I, I never under, I guess I never really understood that it was, it, there's no sort of objective to win. It's just, you're creating a virtual universe, virtual reality of some sort. Yes, totally. Now, and again, there are wow. stories in games that are very specific. Here's your objective, get to the point, finish the story. Right. And video game esque, totally fine. There's plenty of TTRPGs that play like that, but the lots of the good ones, we're going to put in quotations here have that ability to be much more than what they start as. Um, the mechanics and fun stuff like that that is thrown into the game might be very video gamey. Go to this point, shoot this person. Go to this next point, shoot this person. Dodge a couple shots, blah, blah, blah. But as you're telling those stories, afterwards you get all the, the, the nitty gritty details. Lancer is a great example of this. You know, the combat and fighting doesn't have a lot of story besides what the heck you're fighting, but the aftermath and in-between stuff happens you know between missions that's where the characters interact for the most part so on and so forth okay we are at the hour mark so i'm gonna i'm gonna wrap it up um 
and we're going to do our, your guys' extra. So this is your couple minutes to, uh, someone's, someone's knocking at my door. That's a three-year-old, I can tell. Um, so I'm going to give you guys a couple seconds to, again, reset your website, what you guys do, all that fun stuff, any important stuff that's coming up for you guys that you want people to know about. Um, and any last thoughts about tonight's session? We're going to start with ladies first this time. So Sarah. Thank you. Well, Rook, Raga, Younger, thank you for having me. This was very interesting. I learned a lot, actually. So I appreciate that. And in the theme of virtual, right, I would love to promote my book that's coming out in 2024. Uh, don't have a title yet, but it's my first travel adventure memoir. You can go to emboldenadventures.com backslash book. And it's about my five week adventure going from Morocco to the Amazon rainforest into the southern Peru and Bolivian Andes mountains, and then coming home to New York City as coronavirus is shutting down the city. And in that time, I did, as I mentioned earlier, seven ayahuasca ceremonies, the psychedelic with uh, the Shibido shaman. So that was my virtual reality and a world that I got to go into, into the multi-dimension. So I think there's some similarities there about how do we learn and, and these sort of adventures that are like the hero's journey, whether it's through gaming or through real life or through the hologram that we're living in or through travel. So emboldenadventures.com, find me on social media, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and check out my book when it comes out next year. Thank you. Fantastic. I was going to say, don't don't run off though. Stick around. We we, we have talking after the show to do. Wow. Andrew, <laughs> please, your turn. Yeah. So, um, I, Sarah, for for somebody that I mean, we talk a lot about. I think very specifically, sort of D and D and storytelling, and um, I think this is the element that people typically miss is that storytelling, group storytelling, right? And I I think that it's very it is very tribal that, you know, we get together in this, these groups, we share stories, we combine to share stories. It's a very oral tradition sort of experience. Um, there just happens to be, I think, dice create those elements of surprise, even for our storytelling, right? So that you don't, you don't always have control. It's, it's always this improv, uh, yes, and no, but, you know, like there's all of these decision making paths that we go down. Um, as for me, uh, I I am a very IRL type of person, right? So if you're looking for for real characters in your business, uh, those are the times that you would want to connect with me at a head support dot com. And this has been wonderful. I, I really have enjoyed the conversation and just talking about what those experiences are because i think sarah nailed it right and i and i lose sight of this sometimes that it is an emotional event to connect with other people that we play with because you know we are we are sharing through fantasy we are sharing who we really are or how our brains really work which is uh is really quite rare and and fun so i appreciate you having me on and uh, again, Andrew at aheadsupport.com. Fantastic. Our turn now. Wahaha. So uh, we have an event tomorrow. We'll be there from 10 to 4 uh, at West Valley High School, causing havoc as a little pop up event. We'll be playing games, selling dice. We got fun new products that showed up tonight. I have taken pictures and they'll be posted eventually in the server. So wahaha. Um, let's see what else. Uh, end of year event. Um, our next set of games, we will not be playing... Wait, next week. We might be playing next week. We'll see. It depends on people's schedule because we're getting close to the holidays. Obviously, people will know, as we know, both Wednesday and Thursday next week. Um, and then the following Friday would be the 29th for our next podcast. That might be me and Younger's end of year review. So if you're interested in that, uh, hear us yaddle about our businessy stuff coming up. Check that out. Um, I don't think we'll have any star guests for that one, which is unfortunate because I'm pretty sure some people have scheduled for that date. I'm going to have to move them, but you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> so, uh, with all that being said, it's still December. So our 10% code for this month is still Santa 907, capital S, lowercase everything else, Santa 907, 907. I should, I should clarify 907. So if you do an, if you do an O, you're going to be really upset. Um, <laughs> but check out the website, epicsages.com. Check out all the fun podcasty stuff that you guys have missed before this. This is episode 411. 
Uh, and with adventure in mind, I hope you guys have a wonderful time. Happy New Year. Merry Christmas. Happy Holidays. Here's to a great yes, one next year. Holiday. And here comes music.